Um, then we'll go to, uh, I'll start with the member, our members. We have, um, who else is here? Olga Flores? Here. Um, and myself, Shreya Jimenez. Um, and then does everyone else, uh, and oh, Jay Young. Does everyone else just wanna kind of go through and identify themselves, please? <laughs> Oh, well, oh. Um, Betty Viegas here. Maggie. Uh, Maggie, Maggie, Maggie Amado Tejas with the Pima County Community Land Trust. Present. Marcos. Marcos Ismael, Pima County Community and Workforce Development. Okay. Betty, did you already go? Yes. Um, uh, Lee Kiwis, uh, City of Tucson, HCD. Hi, everyone. Corin Manning, City of Tucson Planning and Development Services. Hi, everyone. Mary Ann Beerling, Compass Affordable Housing. David Wall, Newport. Megan Headings, Family Housing Resources. Joe Audino, Historic Fourth Avenue Coalition, Barrio Neighborhood Coalition. And then I see a Charlie Buchanan. Hi everyone, Charlie Buchanan with Habitat for Humanity Tucson. Thank you. I see a WMSC's iPhone. Yeah, that's Mark Clark from Pima Council on Aging. Oh, great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for being with us. And I see one Zoom user, unidentified. Maybe it's someone's audio. Okay, I think I got everyone. So let's move <laughs> along to the next. Did I, did I miss anybody? Leticia. Shay, uh, this is Leticia Carpio, City of Tucson. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to the next item, which is, I keep, I keep losing the, which is our we'll call, call, call to the audience. So this is a time when any member of the public may address the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development. Due to time constraints, the total time allocated for this is 15 minutes. Individuals are allowed three minutes each. Due to open meeting law, commission members cannot discuss topics that are not on the agenda. Items brought up by the public may be considered as an agenda item for a future meeting. Do we have anybody who'd like to speak? Okay, hearing none, um, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Okay, so this is the big one. <laughs> uh, we have this source of income protection item that we began to discuss in pretty great detail at our last um, uh, commission meeting. So um, I'll leave the floor open if anyone would like to take, take the lead on this. So I'll just ask, um, and, and maybe you discussed this last time when I had to leave, but how long is the public comment period and when will it be back on the agenda for the city council? So, um, Betty, I'll attempt to address this, that um, right now we are, developing some information materials in terms of, of what this is and our attorney's office are working on drafting what the actual ordinance language would be. So right now I'd say we're kind of entering to an engagement process regarding it. 
um, don't have a specific timeline, um, but the attorney's office didn't think it would take that long to draft. Um, but really more wanting to make sure the outreach is, is happening and um, clarifying what it is and what it isn't. So that's, those are the type the materials that we're in the process of developing now. Okay, thanks. I also was wondering about the timeline for this and if there's a public process outlined, I, I was curious more about those details. Yeah, so that's where we're in process of meeting. We've had a few organizations reach out to us. And so we're in process of, of meeting with them and open to your all suggestions in terms of what you'd like to see in terms of engagement, um, but still really thinking through this and feel like in terms of agendizing this on this committee, we'd love to hear what people think in terms of what they'd like to see. Um, has the Tucson Association of Realtors been uh, stepped up or? Um, we've had a preliminary conversation with them. We were going to meet with them again yesterday, but that ended up getting postponed. And I believe it's going to be rescheduled to February 1st. Um, so they're a group, you know, multifamily housing, of course, um, reached out to us or, uh, originally. And so few stakeholders that absolutely need to have continued conversations with. Okay, um, Joe, I see your hand up if you'd like to speak. Yeah, my question was, if we're talking about outreach, we know that um, at the last CHD meeting, we heard from Arizona multi-tenant and some property management and, and ownership interests. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's important that we hear that side. I was wondering if there's also outreach so that we hear from um, people who this would be impacted by because um, maybe they've seen some of the issues with source of income discrimination, whether that's people on disability, SSI, housing choice voucher users. Is there some kind of outreach there so we hear from those people as well? Yeah, I'm a bit unclear myself. And so who is taking the lead on this in the department? Is it HCD? Is it PDSD? Who's, is there some one person that's been sort of assigned? You know, H, HCD working in collaboration with the attorney's office. Um, and so, and I'll say Liz, who presented at the last meeting is, is more the lead here, um, given all of her section eight experience. So full disclosure, this is not my my area, but um, absolutely learning quickly in terms of what what a source of income ordinance would or wouldn't accomplish. And so, um, but yeah, open and Joe, you're absolutely right. That was the last meeting. My thought too was um, really making sure that there's more intentional outreach to all sorts of folks, you know, whether they'd be supportive or not, and just making sure we're reaching broad audiences. And then I had another question. I was curious about the, I, I didn't see the mayor and council session. Who, which politically, which was this a motion? Who, who made the motion? Um, I can bring it up. So the um, council member Kazachik is the one that agendized it. And I think he made the motion off the top of my head, but I'll look that up while you all are talking. Um, and ooh, Jay, Jay looks like he might know that answer. Oh, no, I, I don't. I was just going to make a comment. So I don't know the answer to that. Um, so Council Member Kazachek made, initiated the item with, and the mayor has also expressed a lot of support in terms of making this happen sooner than later. Okay, yeah, that's what I, I figured it was Kazachek because I did see a headline on somewhere with his, his face and then this, the headline was about this income protection. So I assumed it was him, but I didn't know for sure. Um, Jay, did you wanna, you had a question? Um, well, I was just gonna make a, a, a comment. I don't know that I really have a question. And you know, I, one of the things that really concerned me and I, I think we're addressing that here, but um, 
you know, one, the fact that there's not actual language in the ordinance yet, I think was problematic for the meeting last time because I felt like a lot of what I heard uh, people saying in, in opposition to a source of income protection ordinance just was not accurate at all. So, you know, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we're getting out ahead of this. And, and Joe, I think you make a great point uh, as well. I mean, we really need to hear from folks who, you know, have Section 8 vouchers or who, who have gotten vouchers and have just really struggled to be able to use them because places literally won't even give them an opportunity uh, to apply because they have a voucher. So, you know, I really want to make sure that we get uh, all sides of this. And, um, you know, one of my concerns, obviously, you know, that the, the housing industry, uh, if you want to call it that, I mean, obviously, uh, have a lot to say about this. But, you know, when it comes to solving a lot of the issues that I think that we see in terms of affordable housing and housing in general, uh, I don't see a lot of solutions coming from from the industry. Um, you know, the, the kind of point is that if we do anything that's pro tenant or, you know, uh, adding any protections that, you know, the sky is going to fall, nobody's ever going to build affordable housing in Tucson again. And I, I just find that to be really problematic. So I hope that we, you know, as a commission going forward can get on the same page about, um, you know, what this really means for our community. And, you know, remember that I think really what we're supposed to be doing is breaking down barriers to affordable housing and clearly, um, you know, keeping people out of housing because of their source of income is a barrier, you know, regardless of whether or not this is going to solve all the problems or, you know, some of the other things that that are still out there are going to be out there. But anyway, I just hope that we as a commission can uh, move that ball forward because I do think it's it's important. Um, I, I just want to can I. I was trying to find the hand, but I, I don't know where to find it. Um, I agree with Jay. Um, it it was it was disappointing to hear so many people speak negative about this. Um, I think it's important to make clear that it's it's not just any income because you don't want drug money <laughs> income you know i think i think what you need to show is verifiable income and that's important so it, it's it you have to put that in the language um for one and um also what i hear a lot of is that and i you know i didn't want to keep going the other day but um, landlords also don't want to make the repairs necessary for it to pass HQS a lot of times. And so if there was a way to incentivize that somehow, um, that might be another, another option for us to, to consider. You know, and I'm not saying just give slumlords money, but um, maybe if you give some lords money with some stipulations <laughs> for long term affordable or longer term uh, affordable period, you know, different things, you know, but the important thing is, is um, that, you know, landlords, landlords have rights, right, just as tenants have rights. And, and in this state, landlords have more rights than tenants. So, um, I think um, maybe doing some um, some education on what those rights are and where there can be some some overlap in you know hey you know landlord um, you know this this section eight holder they're, they're you know like they they just need help right now you know and 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 you know, you can get stable rent, you know, stable, stable um, rental income, you know. Um, so, that, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of work to do. I didn't know how far in the process it was. So basically, it's really, really early is what you're saying, Ann. Yes, it's early and yet mayor and council did express, you know, an interest in getting the ordinance passed sooner than later um, with input on on what the implementation looks like and 
Um, but yes, early in the, we absolutely need to do a lot of outreach and education. Um, Allison and I were on a meeting today where, where it was a different topic, but an idea of misinformation plan and, you know, we're hearing concerns about this, but, but here's, here's what this will actually, you know, here's the facts on what this would do. And so thinking through all of that is, is going to be important. I saw Olga's hand up and Maggie's. I don't know who had theirs first, but if you'd like to go, is that, are you guys wanting to speak? Just really quickly. I mean, speaking as a certified housing counselor right now, change careers, I can vouch that there are a lot there that cannot find homes. We get multiple calls every day and we don't even do rental assistance, so to speak. We do rental counseling, but the amount of people with Section 8 vouchers out there, the number that Liz announced at the commission meeting was startling. This is going to cause another type of crisis. Um, and something needs to be done. When I didn't say anything, I was probably the only commissioner that didn't say anything because I needed to calm down. It was the fact that they're not looking at the, the rents raised for other reasons, um, it's just, it frustrates me. So speaking from somebody that gets a lot of phone calls all day long, it's gonna cause another problem if we don't add this protection, it really will. That's what I'm seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's all I wanted to say though. And then what I wanted to add is I had a, I had a conversation with the friend of mine who's a broker, an investor, uh, et cetera. And he actually had um, nothing but good to say. He has a lot of Section 8 uh, rentals. I'm wondering if we, you know, when we do the outreach and if we could get, I think that it would go farther if we have, you know, especially people who are in the housing industry who are uh, supporting Section 8, not necessarily this, you know, source of income thing, but that they're, they're having, you know, a good, um, you know, they're, they're, they're having good results with their Section 8 vouchers. And so, and, and, and unlike, and like Betty said, it's, it's uh, guaranteed, you know, it's something that's going to happen. So uh, just, I'm wondering if we should add that to the outreach and education component. And maybe that's where our um, role is in this, is to come up in helping the city with an outreach plan on education. You know, we've got Jay here who, you know, obviously is, is very well versed on fair housing and what, and uh, if we could get, I don't know, Jay, I'm sure you know a lot, a lot of the landlord tenant laws as well, but, um, maybe somebody from uh, from that realm, you know, could could join us in, in coming up with with an outreach plan on um, to to educate the the property managers um, as well as the public, you know. I mean, we know that that there is that stigma that it's going to be hard to overcome because people only really um, property managers focus on the ones that, that are the problem, that, that create the problems, you know, and so that's where a lot of the, the emphasis is, and that's where the, uh, uh, the automatic thought process goes to all the ones that cause the problems, um, but really, I don't, I think the percentage, maybe we need to look at percentages, you know, and, and get some data on on that, you know, to show that uh, it's people like like you and me that need help sometimes, you know, and also um, it would be good for for single family rentals for um, for them to participate in the um, uh, God, I can't think of the name of that. the 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 um, 
the FSS, the financial stability, where they can, they can um, a percentage of their Section 8 funding goes into a fund for down payment assistance or other things in the future. So it's a, it's a program that helps Section 8 holders um, prepare for home ownership, you know, as they're going through uh, uh, the process of, you know, case, they're being case managed and they're helped along the way. And I know that um, the city has that program um, and they have people in that program. I know people that have graduated from that program and have houses, you know, so it's not all about, you know, um, long term um, Section 8 holders, you know, although there are quite a few of them that, you know, are on fixed incomes and can't go, can't do anything else. But there's also those that, that want to get out of, you know, rental and go into home ownership. So think about that as well. Thank you, Betty. I, I'm sorry, I, I see a remaining time up here. Is anyone? Okay. Is I'm, that I'm trying to work on that in the background. I'm not sure why we have a Zoom account. I swear we pay for it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, Jim, do you, uh, or Jay, I think Jay, you were first and then Jim. Doesn't look like Jay, your hand was probably still yeah, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, what I, I so I have a question basically, and then uh, another comment that that Betty sparked for me. But um, I guess I'm actually just wanting to know, and, and there's been you know, I've been talking to folks kind of outside of Tucson as well. Um, what did actually pass? Because you know the newspaper said there was an ordinance that was passed, and then it's like. There wasn't an ordinance. It's, it's so like what has actually <laughs> happened, and then what actually would need to happen for a source of income protection ordinance to go into place. I think that the mechanics of it are, are confusing to me. And then I have a comment after that as well. Um, Jay, I did post thanks to Joe who tracked down the exact motion. Is you should be able to see it in the chat now, um, and so. It, you know, and it was council member Kazachik who essentially said create an, a draft an ordinance that and, and bring it back to us. So bring that it is, back to them for them to vote on to pass it then? Is yes. That, okay, so there is a chance then that this that nothing will be passed. I mean, that is a possibility. That is how I would interpret it. Okay. And then my, my comment, um, you know, again, from a fair housing perspective that Betty really sparked for me that, you know, I, I as well as Olga really had to uh, take it down a notch after the meeting last week. And that's not really my, my style. But one of the things that really got me hot under the collar was some of the things that were said that I think really are stigmas for people that use Section 8 housing. Um, and, you know, again, I just feel like you know, if we have equity in our name as a commission, those are the types of things that we really have to push back against. Again, as a fair housing advocate, one of the things that, um, you know, I think at least from a fair housing perspective that's so problematic about this is, you know, this has a disparate impact on folks that are protected by the Fair Housing Act, persons with disabilities, families with children, uh, people of color. And, you know, I think the when I hear those kinds of comments and those kinds of stigmas, I, I think it's thinly veiled uh, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of instances, I'll just say it, I think it's, there's a lot of racism there. So I think that when we hear that kind of stuff, that kind of stigma, that it, as a commission, again, talking about equitable housing, we really need to push back on it. And that alone for me is also a big reason to, that I think we need to, to really move this forward. So anyway, I'll just, I've said a lot already. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, Jim, did you have some thoughts? Sure. So, you know, I I don't really have a pony in this fight outside of being part of this commission. Um, this I learned about this issue for the first time, uh, the meeting before last, and uh, I did a little bit of uh, research over the last month, 
Uh, most of us were in the last commission meeting and, and heard all of the people speaking up um, against uh, this type of, uh, um, I don't know, what, what is this called? Is it a, a legislation? Um, and I, I think we have to be careful here um, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, this is going to be hotly contested. Um, and so it, it's most likely going to take a while to complete. And I think my, my biggest concern, you know, outside of the potential uh, unintended consequences, which we don't really understand what, exactly what those are at this point. Um, but my biggest concern is I'm not sure it's going to solve the problem. There's, there is a problem where people who have Section 8 vouchers can't get housing. And this, this uh, legislation is, you know, is it going to do something? Maybe. But if somebody doesn't want to have a Section 8 person in their, in their unit, there's going to be 15 other ways they can get out of it. So, you know, the, the question becomes, if this doesn't work, what's next? And, and is there things that can be done to help solve this problem that don't require, uh, you know, additional ordinance from mayor and council? Um, you know, I think some of the improvements that the housing department is trying to make where they pay people more quickly um, and don't necessarily wait for inspections and understand the turnover cycle and all those things. I think those are going to probably have a much bigger impact than, than this ordinance. Um, and so I think, I think we need to be smart about it. Yeah. Sorry to jump in here, but we're, we've been trying to pay to extend time on our end because we're clearly having a Zoom issue and we have not been able to figure out and there's three minutes. So we I can do one of two things. Sorry, I hope you keep your thought going, Tim. One, I can we can actually go to the Teams link that was originally in the meeting invite. Sorry, again, this is a pain. Um, so there's that, or we can send a new new Zoom link out. Shay, as chair, maybe just make that call. Let's just use the Teams link. Okay. <laughs> Most of us can Sorry, y'all. Does anybody <laughs> not have that? I'm not sure where to I don't come. have it. I can, I'll send a, uh, another calendar. Um, I'll send an email with that, but it's in the original calendar invite that you have. Accidentally, there was a Teams link and a Zoom link. Oh, okay. Um, so it's, yeah, it I should can. Be, and, and I'll you send. Can, you can use your own browser. You don't need the app, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'll Just send the, that. Apologies, my fault. <laughs> who else said they didn't have it? I think Joe Olga and, and Olga. Yeah, I'm not okay. sure. I'm looking at the calendar invite, and I, I see. I don't see a Teams. But... I found mine. Well, if you could Scroll send it. Scroll down, out. Mark. Scroll down. All the way down. It's yeah, underneath. down at the bottom. The very last. Oh, oh, not on my iPad. It's not. Hmm. Joe, what's your email? Uh, Joe at the Joe.org. And then Allison should have it already. No, I don't think I, I just, do. I just put the Teams link in the chat. Oh. All right. Okay. I'm going to exit everyone. Thank you.
successfully open meeting off. Can we restart the Zoom? That countdown timer, it's so much pressure, you know, it's like. <laughs> I, mean, I hate interrupting people too. And Jim, you were like in a real, real groove there. <laughs> well, and let me just, I'll just finish. I was basically just about done. You know, the bottom, bottom line is it's pretty obvious. <clears throat> the commission as a whole it is fairly well aligned um, in terms of the support of this ordinance. But I just, my personal feeling is it's gonna, it's gonna be, you know, a difficult fight at the, at the council level. And I'm not sure it's gonna solve the problem. And I think that, that, you know, if there was other things that this, this uh, group can do to, you know, find other, more maybe other creative ways to address this, uh, you know, that might, that might be better use of our time. At some point, the ordinance will be written, and I'm sure that that, um, that we're going to be asked to provide a letter in support of it. And I'm, I'm, you know, just based on the group that we have, that's most likely going to pass, and we're going to send a letter in support of it. But it, again, if it doesn't really solve the problem, um, you know, what are things that that we can do that will have a, a a real impact that that don't require an ordinance to be passed by the council. That's it. I see Marcos's hands up and Megan's. I don't know who is first. Marcos, do you want to go? Okay. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I just wanted to suggest a pairing a, um, I guess a um, a um, a beefed up or boosted landlord incentive program along with this ordinance, um, which I think would address the housing supply issue or at least provide some you know some some real ways to to increase the number of rental units and i found two studies on the hud website that um looked at two housing authorities that did a good job and i know the city's already started working uh you know with, with incentives that's why i say kind of like a beefed up or boosted incentive program and um you know one of the issues that was touched on in the in the study was the um, you know uh, a fee for holding the unit or some type of compensation for having the landlord hold that unit and I think that was an issue that was brought up by some of the property managers and owners that were commenting um, you know on this issue and you know there there was a study where a housing authority um, you know created an incentive. Um, you know, to address that issue, um, you know, some compensation for reserving the unit. And the other thing was a uh, kind of like a landlord hotline and a dedicated team um, that was, um, you know, that was just doing landlord communications and um, responding to, you know, um, landlord request for information or, um, you know, whatever uh, issues they were having. Um, the fact was just having a staff person that could respond to that landlord's concerns and help resolve the issues. Uh, so things like that, you know, combined with some of the incentives the city is already doing and, you know, looking at, at some other things. And, you know, Liz mentioned something on, you know, um, that I thought of, you know, that a lot of the large property owners have a threshold um, where they'll only allow 6% of the units that will accept Section 8 uh, voucher holders, but only in 6% of their units. She said, I seem to mention her, remember her mentioning that 6%. 
seemed to be what was used most widely by the large, you know, property owners. And, you know, if we could work with those types of properties to get them to start increasing that and, you know, find some incentives that would help landlords make more landlords that are already accepting units that, that a way to get them to maybe free up some more units uh, for Section 8, increase their threshold from 6% to 10% or maybe even 20. Um, and I think we could see an immediate impact uh, doing some things like that. And I'll, I'll look for the link to those uh, studies and, and see if I can um, the staff at the city and anyone else who's interested. Thank you, Marcos. That sounds, yeah, I would love to read through that. That would be really helpful. I was just going to add, um, I don't disagree with Jim in, in identifying that there are um, challenges that would probably still be in place for um, landlords to find ways to not rent to tenants, even if there was an ordinance in place. But I don't think that should discourage us from pursuing it. I do, this does seem like a barrier that should not be in place, that you're just solely restricted because of the source of income, because of the Section 8 voucher. And so I would still encourage that this is an important sort of fundamental right that everyone should have. And then on top of that, we need to look at the execution and say there are still administrative challenges. I think that there's real reasons why landlords try and prevent this. And there's because it incurs additional costs, burden, administrative time on staff. Um, in dealing with a lot of the Section 8 voucher holders. And so, you know, making improvements to the program can essentially boost those, you know, so there isn't a deterrent for landlords to work with the program. And I appreciate the incentive program the city has been working on, but I think there's other um, work that needs to happen. But I just want to kind of establish that I think it's important for us to still pursue and support the ordinance because it is sort of should be, in my opinion, a level of protection that all people should have. It, it should not be something that you're denied housing because of the Section 8 that you hold the voucher. So that's my perspective. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I think we've spent quite a bit of time on this, so we should probably move on unless there's any other comments. I um, I think we're at the beginning stages and there's still a lot. I think this will keep coming up, probably recurring, so we can it can just be an item that we you know are tracking. and I, I agree though, I think a letter of support would be helpful and in any ways we can help with outreach and engagement or, you know, I think HCD has started getting like really nice little videos of people who, uh, you know, want to speak out in, in favor, you know, maybe we can refer people, um, be of help that way. But, um, but yeah, I, I, Anne, did you have something? Yeah, I just, um, Shay, I would say, yes, we're, we're, Absolutely, if you have ideas, um, really appreciate the comments, but outreach ideas, thoughts, you know, we've been trying to collect um, stories of Section 8 landlords who are, are happy with the program. That's something we were doing far be before this came, came up, but um, so really open to ideas. We are drafting, we're trying to do a two-page summary I mentioned, so I know some of the other communities have developed really helpful materials, and if anyone comes across a Examples of that, feel free to send them our way, please. Hey, Anne, I've got an idea. What, what would you think about having a, uh, you know, maybe a working group with uh, some of the major either property management companies, both who, who do accept Section 8 and those who don't, just do, you know, maybe a three or four session working group to to talk to them about the issues, understand it, talk about what are some creative ways to, to get around those and, and, and hear from the guys on the front line who are dealing with this. You know, and it's important to hear from the people who don't want it because if they ultimately, if they don't want it, they're gonna find another reason not to do it. So 
you know, if you can solve their issues and their concerns, and the first step is to understand them. You know, that at least. Yeah, you know. I'm happy to talk to Liz. I do think a working group could be helpful. I think it would have to be balanced with people who um, absolutely on the landlord side understand those, but also on the, on the tenant side and on the um, Section 8 voucher side. So I think a balanced working group that can work through how to best execute whatever gets passed and, and inform what gets passed. Um, something I'll talk to Liz about, but good good idea, Jim. I'm curious, and on the tenant side, has the Tucson Tenants Association Union been contacted? No, and, and um, you know, any information you want to share with them, I actually don't have much, con I mean, I don't know who's running running what they do, but it's something I'd, I'd love them to at least make sure they're aware of. Yeah, I was on another call yesterday and I think there were some folks over there. So I'll, I'll try to find some context for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, we'll move on to the next item unless there's anything else pressing or burning. <laughs> okay, so the next item we have is uh, the ADU updates. So I guess I'll start that off. Um, we had our first uh, kickoff meeting for our Mi Casita project. We um, are moving forward now that the ordinance has passed. It was amazing. We had over 240 people register for the Zoom event and over the uh, like 145 participate, I think I saw is at the max. So it was overwhelmingly successful. It felt really, went really, really well. Um, there was a lot of great questions. Um, we did a survey and um, kind of confirmed a lot of things we had been, um, we had been, you know, uh, things that we had assumed. Um, there's a lot of interest. A lot of people want to do this for their families. It was all homeowners. Um, there was uh, a lot of do-it-yourselfers. I think that's what's going to make this program different than probably other cities is that we have a lot of people who want to build and be a part of the process themselves and or have family members or know people in the trades. So it was a very, very much a DIY crowd. And so I think, again, we really were, we were assuming that that was gonna be the case, but to see such strong presence of our also small, small builders present um, was really, really encouraging. Small local builders, it, I feel like it's very much gonna shape into a program that we're hoping it will be, which is small locally led, um, owner occupied kind of projects. So, um, so it was very encouraging, um, and I, I, yeah, I'm excited to move forward and to to get through the next series of focus groups. And um, we've we've been awarded two grants now, one through Vitalis and the other the Thriving Communities through the Food Bank. So um, we're we're hoping we can uh, work through the details in the, the next year, <laughs> but we're still also at the very beginning stages. So. It was it was good. And then um, Olga, did you have some updates, I think, on that as well? I don't know if it's necessarily the right time to talk about it yet, but I just wanted to kind of bring it out there about accessing for some of these borrowers or these clients that may not have the income or the or the equity or how can we help protect them not to lose so much of their equity when they go to look into having this done. And so I just wanted to bring up that conversation and also ask, um, I did have a couple of meetings with lenders and there are ways to access capital, but they're hard. They're, they're hard. From being in the, in the field, these programs, you have to have really good credit, you have to have really good assets. Um, and it's there's just not a lot for people that are low to moderate income. And so I just wanted to bring out the conversation just to start thinking about it right now. I don't think we're quite there yet, but is the city um, to help with subsidies? I know we're doing 
the project, right? Like with the the pro was it the pilot program, Jay? With some some people. But what about outside of that when it comes time for these, you know, low to moderate income people that have big yards that can um, build in their yard? How are we gonna help them? What can we do, if anything, can we do to help them access the capital or the credit? in a fair way to make sure that they're, again, not losing their equity and they're not being taken advantage of. So that's that's basically, I just wanted to kind of plant the seed and then maybe we can discuss it later on as well. Yeah, I think we're really early on in the process and I think we'll definitely vet through those things as we get further along. But yeah, I, I think that's why the, again, the program that I saw that was the coolest that addressed that nationally was in Denver, where they paired the community land trust model with the casita, so that basically nice. when, you, when you did the refi, or it, they had this mortgage product that when you, it was especially designed for people who were on the verge of foreclosure, but it could work with anyone who was kind of in the position where we keep saying like they had a lot of equity, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of cash or maybe wouldn't income qualify necessarily for those higher, you know, loan amounts. So in those cases, they were folding the deals into the land trust. So once the land is taken out of the deal, in a lot of cases, they were able to refinance for about the same mortgage payment or only slightly higher and pull, basically enabled them to pull out all the equity in the house fold the deal into a land trust model and then but again the caveat then being that now you're part of a land trust you know and right. so it was really interesting but when we talked with those folks actually we we met with them early last or late last fall they had it was looked great on paper but no one was taking advantage of the program like they hadn't had any applicants wow. <laughs> even though they had launched it and it had been available for like a few months. So that's kind of what we're trying to avoid here and going through a pretty lengthy public process is to figure out, you know, with all of these things, it's like balancing the affordability restrictions with the incentives, I feel is really the key and finding that right balance and making sure it's been vetted with, you know, community members in real time because, you know, there are trade offs for affordability and housing affordability and I think we have to be realistic about how much time people want to commit for affordability periods and what they're willing to give up. Um, you know, it's kind of the same question, same sort of discussion we're having with this la tenant landlord protection. I think it, it it's going to happen at every at every level. True. Thank you. Yeah, that program is called the Stay in Place Program, and it was Elevation Community Land Trust in Denver. If you look up Elevation Community Land Trust, then Stay in Place Program, it'll pop right up. And um, there's a they put out a really cool YouTube video where they go into, I probably didn't describe the financials correctly, but they go through the math and explain the whole process. And, um, I, and again, but it just goes back to, again, I love, you know, I love the land trust model. I think it's great, um, but I think that there's also still a lot of public education that has to happen around that too as well for people that really understand it and be, get excited about it. And um, But Mag Maggie, you have your hand up and then David. Yeah, so the biggest you know, issue for financing is you know, to be mortgage ready. And regardless, it doesn't really matter your income getting a, a loan is is a relation between your income and your expenses and also how much so how much you qualify for and right now what we're seeing in our market with these elevated prices that people are priced out they they can't qualify for enough mortgage to purchase the price the houses that are in our market right now and but it'll be a similar issue with our existing homeowners who maybe are house rich cash poor if they want to get financing they will have to have some kind of documentable income to guarantee to a lender that they can repay the mortgage so i think a lot of that has to do with you know education and and getting people mortgage ready so housing counseling is a huge component of this getting people to understand that relationship between their income and their debt 
um, their credit, et cetera. And, and then also talking to lenders about maybe creating more flexible underwriting criteria for homeowners who have a ton of equity in their home. And uh, maybe like ratios can be higher, I don't know. But those are the discussions that you know we'll be having at the land trust with, with partners and also identifying just other sort of types of sources for loans, including the IDAs and, you know, um, I don't know, other other resources that are maybe not main la mainstream lenders. So that's kind of where we're at, but, but it's always gonna be that relationship. There's, you know, a difference between a grant and a loan. So that's it. David? A couple of points um, and addressing Maggie's. Uh, a thousand years ago, before I moved to Tucson, I ran a um, lending consortium among a bunch of banks that uh, did multifamily financing. Um, it's theoretically possible to work with local banks through an existing entity like perhaps the IDA, either of the IDAs or Community Investment Corp or maybe whatever the nonprofit loan fund is now called. Um, to the whole point being that if a number of lending institutions are involved, are invested in every loan, then the uh, risk of loss on any loan is mitigated and won't fall on one lender. It'll fall on the entire pool. And so it's a, it's a fairly small hit. The, when we were setting it up in uh, the late 80s, um, the pitch was, it's like buying a mutual fund versus buying an individual stock. So that's, that's point number one. So it, it might be worth working with some, some lending, established lending entity that has the infrastructure in place um, to, to set something like that up. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, with all due respect to the Denver model um, and to land trust, I think it's a pretty big sell to existing homeowners to say, yeah, you, you've got to transfer your land into this or into this kind of entity that you don't understand. And that's going to limit your, um, your rights to sell the property. It's going to limit your ability to take equity out of the property. That, that's a really heavy lift. And that's all I got to say. Yeah. And I, I think that's why their program hasn't been utilized. It's a hard, that's what we keep saying. It's kind of a hard sell, you know, but I think that there's there ways, ways to incentivize again without bringing down the heavy, you know, heavy hands. Maggie, did you have thoughts? Yeah, actually it's that, what amazes me about the SIP program is that it doesn't seem to be, it's a win, 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 win. So the way that the program works is that, you know, you have a, a couple who, you know, maybe they're living in their house and they're like having some financial issues. They're actually selling their home at market value to the land trust. And then they're purchasing it back under a community land trust. So they're selling it like a fee simple and then they're buying it back as a leasehold, which is automatically less money. So that leaves them with some money, right? And that's the, but obviously it requires on the, on the part of the land trust, a lot of money, subsidies, a lot of subsidies there. So, because you're gonna be paying more than what you're gonna be getting back. And uh, $30 a month for a land trust fee isn't gonna cut, isn't gonna make up the difference, but what it will do, it will create another unit of permanently affordable housing in our community. And so it is actually a, you know, it, I think it's a really cool model and I'm not, sure and and they seem to have the financing to be able to do this um but I, so i'm not sure why it's not working i think uh permanent affordability you're you're in trouble you want to stay in your house you sell it for market rate you buy it back for less 
and you've got some money left over maybe to pay off your bills. I mean, that's kind of how that video worked. And, and you just agree that, you know, this home has to be affordable forever. There's resale restrictions. You got to sell it to another low and moderate income household. And you get to keep 20, whenever you sell it, you can sell it again anytime to another low to moderate income household. You get to keep 25% of whatever it has gone up in value. So I don't, I don't really, I don't think it's a hard sell really. I mean, obviously there's people who like land trust model and people who would never, but most people who, you know, are, are not able to purchase a home in the, you know, market, you know, and I can give you examples of, of what we're doing right now with our, you know, the five houses that we've done, they're appraising as a leasehold at 240 some thousand dollars and people are coming in out of pocket um, with their mortgage of 144,000. And most of our homeowners have gotten additional subsidies that then stay with them. So we've gotten many people with mortgages of 122,000. So tell me right now where you can buy a three bedroom, two, two bath, brand new house with a garage for a $122,000 mortgage. It's nowhere other than with Elantra. So, you know, it, if you're looking at affordability, it's, it's, you know, and, and being able to purchase and be a homeowner, I think it's a, it's, it's a no brainer actually. Thank you, Meg. Yes, I love the land trust model. I think it's great. <laughs> um, uh, was there any other comments? I just wanna say one last thing is ultimately, I would just like to see a portfolio product developed for Tucson for the ADUs, like a LMI, you know, low to moderate income portfolio product that allows some gifts, subsidies or something like that for closing costs. I don't think it's too hard to come by with. Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of other communities are starting to, you know, figure it out. I, th I think we will as well. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, if we're done with this topic, we'll move on to the next, which, um, which is oh, strategic plan goals. Um, I, and I, I don't have my uh, strategic plan, or last strategic plan up. Should I? Should we table that for for another? So, time? Um, that's up to you. I think. I think the just thinking through what this subcommittee, uh, my sense from you was kind of thinking through what are next major things. Um, looks like we're hitting this 10 minutes, so maybe it's a good tabling for next time. <laughs> and we, we realized what the problem was and we'll fix it. We changed some Zoom accounts, people and users, and in the process, we, we discovered this now, which I'm glad it happened now and not at the full commission meeting. Um, so logistically, how should we handle this? Should we, are we going to have to get off this meeting and then re-enter the same Zoom call or? I mean, I would say this, that our meetings usually go until 530. So I would say let's, let's just try to wrap up and apologies. Okay, we'll fix this for next time. My great. bad all around. Okay, I great. hope we're not, I hope we're not skipping six B and C is all I will say. And I'm happy to to jump in, Shay, if that's okay, and just yes, provide. Let's, let's skip uh, item five for now and move on to item six. Great. Um, so a couple things um, in terms of, yay, Mayor and Council passed the HAST plan. So that is official. And now we're moving into implementation um, a few of you have probably heard me say, really excited that 2022 is going to be about implementation and execution. Um, so a couple updates on things we're working on, and it's a lot and, and open. I really want to use this subcommittee as, as kind of helping us prioritize because we can't do everything tomorrow. Um, but so some of the things that we are working on that were included in the HAST plan um, hiring a development manager to help us move these initiatives forward. I think that what's clear is we have a lot going on and trying to juggle a lot. So that's in process. 
um, A, the uh, project-based voucher and um, funding application, we are looking to get it out sooner than later for in time for people to be notified in time for the April 1st state deadline. So we're looking at that first week in, in February to get it out. Um, and so Leticia is on this call. This is something that we're working with her team on. Um, one of the only things I'll say, there, there's been a question, we've brought it to this commission um, and to the Housing Segregation Subcommittee about having there be a, um, um, a checklist where you can put in your address and making sure that we're prioritizing projects and areas of opportunity. So we're committed to a beta version this year. We'll, we'll ask applicants to go through the process of testing it, but we don't intend to use it for scoring because we know there's still more outreach and engagement that needs to be done on refining the tool. But we want to use this year's application process as a way to help us get it better for next year once it's gone through those processes. And I see David, did, did you have a specific question? I have a very specific question. If you are not getting it out until the first week in February, what's your turnaround? Because uh, we're going to need, we in the development side are going to need to know uh, whether or not we have PBV or home um, so that we can then get financing commitments from our lenders and equity investors. And yes, PBV, great. No PBV, not so great. Uh, if you aren't putting out the application or the RFP even until the first week in February, that doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room. So uh, what's your turnaround time? So we, I agree that um, this year's timeline is not optimal. We're really looking and, and so people know for next year, we plan on doing this process in the fall so that we're not up against the, the timeline. At this point, and Leticia, feel free to jump in. So the um, team that's working on it is looking at giving team, giving developers about a three week turnaround to submit applications. And then from there, we're looking at, at giving us ourselves about a two week turnaround so that the latest people would be notified would be the middle of March. Um, you can expect no Tucson LIHTC approvals this year then. Um, so, David, what in your mind would be the the kind of timeline that you would need to know about P PBVs to be able to submit this year? Very beginning of March. That's helpful. To, to, to work with lenders, to work with equity investors. Okay. And also, also for market studies. I mean, the market study uh, is going to be very, very different um, if the if if x number of units have pbv uh the market analysis is going to look very different than if zero percent of the units have pbv so since since it's an essential since those are points that you're basically going to need um to qualify to to score um if if we don't know that we have pbv and can get it into our applications Goodbye, LIHTC. Okay, um, I appreciate that feedback. I'm, I'm working on what we think is feasible. So, and I will keep folks updated. We have our list of developers that I email things out to every now and then when something's urgent. So I will be sure to keep, keep people updated on that. Um, so the other thing we are working on um, is we've met with attorneys, um, PDSD attorney, our attorney on an impact fee waiver expansion. And that is something that um, starting to push through. Again, timeline on that is, is a little bit challenging because it does involve a lot of other, other departments. And, but people feel like it's feasible, something that we'll want to get engagement on. Um, and then also something that if folks on this call support it. So right now, the way the code reads, you have to be a nonprofit developer. You have, and then the way our policy is, um, it is you have to agree to 
residents that are under 80% of area median income and you have to agree to 15 years. And we are looking to change the language to um, allow for anyone, any developer who meets those affordability requirements. So if they, if anybody submits a project that is focused on 80% AMI or lower and who um, agrees to 15 years, they'd be eligible um, if there's budget available. So, you know, we do get a budget each year because the city has to pay for this. Um, but I think that for, we have not been maxing that budget the last few years and we want to try to incentivize as much development as we can. Uh, and before, I, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but about probably seven or eight months ago, the city um, increased all the impact fees for multifamily. So they actually reduced impact fees for single family and increased impact fees for multifamily. So it's, it's, and it's about 1500 to 2000 a door. It's a lot of money. And so that, that is something if this subcommittee wants to kind of work on and, and talk to mayor and council about changing, I'd say that would be within, you know, within the subcommittee's interest areas. I think that's low hanging fruit personally. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be curious to do a deeper dive into impact fees because <laughs> if you're saying they're in the, did they increase by 15 to 200 a door or is that the total price? Yeah, price? what they did is it, we're running out of time, but multifamily and single family used to have separate rates and they combined them, which essentially brought down the single family rate and increased the multifamily rate to be the same number. It would, be a good, just... it would be a good education for for um, so whoever's we, in charge of impact fees to come and talk to us about how they work. We can do that. Running out of time, yeah. David, you have one thing? Just the, let me point out, ADOH has, clear, has definitely said that impact fee waivers do count for the five points for other local funding. Mm -hmm. So again, if, if, if this can be implemented by April 1, then that's going to give every Tucson developer who qualifies five points that makes their LIHTC applications more competitive. Okay, sorry again for technical difficulties. All right, can we go ahead and adjourn the meeting? We've got <laughs> all those in paper. <laughs> all right, we'll see you all next time. Thank you.